go. Let's uh, um, start out by calling this a, a discussion in a sequence of discussions. And I'd like to discuss uh, what I'm personally exploring. And I'd like to be able to explore it in such a way as to be able to have experiences or gain knowledge that is genuinely useful to other people. And I fully acknowledge that I uh, explored and experimented with so many things in the past. And a lot of them were distractions for myself and distractions for others. And let's see if we can do something that's useful. And what I'm really looking at is, well, what's the eye of the needle? How do things really begin? How was the iris formed? What is the grounding mechanism that creates everything? So I'm, I'm looking at it, and then as I start to do this, I, I start to discover things about myself or about the situation, and it gets to be a little bit disturbing or a little shocking. It's like uh, my latest little personal metaphor, or it's like going down the rabbit hole, if you're familiar with the story of Alice in Wonderland, where she enters into a magical world. Well, for me, that's uh, what we all do. We all enter into a magical illusion. And that illusion begins very early. It may begin as early as conception, but certainly the magical illusion begins in early childhood. So if we can begin to look at what that's like, and maybe we can help ourselves or somebody else, or even our greater world, have a little bit better outcome than we have in the past. And uh, I'll try to give you my own little uh, bits and pieces of things that's going on along the way. And I, I've had some surprises even to myself, some of them pretty shocking. So I'll try to explain it in a way that it may at least appear logical, even though some of them doesn't make any sense at all. And one of the things that I'm working with is that the my experience now in the last few weeks this being October, is that the magnitude of the pain that we're actually dealing with, and by that I mean the magnitude of the pain contained inside each individual soul, is so great that it is uh, shocking. It's so great that it is terrifying. And that the average individual has virtually no desire to find it or feel it, but is driven by the constant desire to avoid it. And that we are, uh, by instinct and training, we're constantly in the process of attempting to deny this pain. And the mechanisms that we use to deny this very large pain within the soul is called the iris, the personality, modified by the birth order and so on. And then gradually it produces relationship attraction. It produces an ongoing desire to create circumstances. It produces a lifetime of a specific method of denying the pain. And it is the denial of the pain that causes organic suffering in the body, and it also causes a deterioration of the mind and mobility in the material body. So this denial of the truth about how we're motivated by fear on the inside, is engaged in the aging process 
and is engaged in every symptom that we're aware of. Yeah, so by by being driven by fear will make us make choices that are out of harmony with love or truth. Exactly. So we are by making the choice to obey fear. Fear is telling us not to face the true pain. So then we produce a wide spectrum of personality attributes and choices and even attempt to do things that appear and act caring and loving, but in fact are actually sophisticated forms of denial. For example, I did teach for a long time specific tools and techniques through meditative processes for people to access deeper feelings and feel better. And they worked for many people, except that it took me decades later to recognize by the use of these very sophisticated tools that actually had results, it taught people how to feel better, how to feel more loving. But it turns out to be that it was actually a well-intended but sophisticated way to avoid the pain. It was a slippery form of denial. And I hold myself responsible for having taught many instruments like that. And even though we can modify it by saying, oh, yes, but you had good intentions and there were good results and you helped a lot of people or whatever else, the truth was it was actually a form of resistance to the truth that I personally used and then personally taught. And, you know, obviously that bothers me. So in the the examination of this by looking at the mechanics and starting to see how the mechanics works has given me more and more of the opportunity to begin to explore how to do it better. So I'm saying, okay, maybe there's something learned by going through the process over the last three decades, but now maybe there are better ways to be able to do this to help ourselves and others. So I'm essentially saying that the my current understanding is at or very near the time of conception, there is a uh, infusion of um, vast amounts of pain in the family tree. And I don't know that all of it arrives at once, but there is so much pain that arrives not only from the family tree, but from the relationship of the mother and father. And interesting enough, the relationship of the mother and father to their mother and father ends up being the place that forms the energy at the base of the spine. So my relationship to my mother and father and their opposite gender patterns of pain with their mothers and fathers forms the bottom of the spine, and I will give it a number as one and two. It forms one and two. And this seems to be the cauldron that that holds enormous amounts of pain and enormous amounts of fear are held in this memory place in the physical body of corresponding it to the bottom of the spine, but in the soul it corresponds to the middle of the soul. So at the point of conception, this enormous amount of pain, and I, I, I'm i still not at the place to be able to comprehend it, but if I would give a probable, very close, literal example, if you could imagine the magnitude of the sun, and you take a soul or an embryo, a conception, and you submerge it into the sun, you would think, oh, this is going to kill them. No, what it does is actually instantaneously set in place 
a kind of uh, bomb shelter asbestos self-protective mechanism where this instantaneous soul-based me mechanism called the will to survive is instantly triggered. Now, from my own looking on the internet at least, apparently 20 to, to as much as 30% of conceptions without even realizing it are miscarried in the first month. And my basic principle or theory about it or opinion, it's a result of this process of being subjected to the mother and father's fear, hatred of each other. I don't want a child. We don't need another mouth to feed. I'm not sure where I want. Or the mother and father say, I need, I need, I need, I need, I need, I want this child. Which turns out to be a whole cascade of unloving behavior about the purpose and intention of having a child. There's lots of ways aggressively and passively to provide an unloving environment for an embryo to come into. And what we don't realize is that the magnitude or power of the soul is greater than the power of the sun. So when we do something that's genuinely unloving, we send out this force which is enormously powerful that other souls receive and they respond back or reject it or hide it or feel it or do something else. So what we're all doing is the same thing. But when the child, the embryo, gets this pain, builds this little fortress, now this fortress is such a painful place that it produces, based on the fear of the pain, it starts to produce very early on a personality expression which has molded right into it its true personality, but it has also the use of that personality as a way of avoiding the pain. Yes, so the facade of the personality created the facade out of that. Of the personality, and then the the harder thing, the really uncomfortable thing for me to grasp was that by the age of two, 100% of the time, I'm in facade because I had to be in facade, a self-protective mechanism in my own family to survive the unloving environment. Now, many people think that they grew up in a loving environment, but it was actually unloving deceptively because it was manipulation, obedience, bribery, you name it. They grew up in an unloving environment. It's not just that they were abused physically or emotionally, but they're abused without knowing that they're abused because the environment was actually an unloving environment. So they, they grew up being entitled or they grew up narcissistic, or they grew up selfish, or they grew up automatically resentful, or bigots, or they grew up racist, or they grew up uh, xenophobic or homophobic. They grew up constantly afraid of something, and they actually liked it. Most people who engage their facade, they like their facade. It's not just the parts of them that look bad and they know it's bad. It's the parts of them that they can't see, but they're still denying. It may be the way they smile. It may be the way they laugh to manipulate somebody else. It may be that they're passive, but in their passiveness, there's a cynicism. Or, or so on and so on. There could be passive or active ways that the facade is created. The problem is, is every single time since the age of two that I've done that, I've actually damaged myself or damaged someone else or the community, the environment, a collective. I'm constantly engaged in the process of building and building and building more and more pain inside of the memory place where the pain was Check. Then the denial of that emotion.
emotional pain in my own soul and the fear of it drove the facade or the personality in such a way to maintain a separation from the capacity to feel it. This denial of the pain over a period of time seems to follow a particular tracking method whereby the age of 40, sorry, Jason, by the age of 40 or 50, people are noticing they're having more mobility problems, more pain, they're, they're having symptoms. Where we're, we're in their 20s or their teens, you know, they don't feel anything because the hormones are moving everything. They only basically feel good unless they're depressed or suicidal or angry or whatever else. But the accumulation of denial is gradually accumulating and producing organic symptoms. And then the average allopath or naturopath says, look, you have some pain. Let's, let's numb down this pain. Let's give you these opiates. Let's give you these other remedies to balance out your condition, to reduce your pain level so that you can feel better. But it doesn't work. It works for a period of time, but the underlying issue of the denial of the original pain and the terror is actually accumulating in such a way as to cause their aging and death. So by the time something gets revealed in the organic body, the material body, it's passed through the spirit body or the vibrational or subtle body or the mind. And it's been there for so long, the actual reversing process is not easy. Now, a good natural path or a good allopath, let's be fair, or an osteopath or chiropractor or whatever else, nutritionist, they can use all of these other remedies, biochemical remedies and vibrational remedies, and mantras and so on and so on, postural techniques and tai chi and yoga, you name it, they can use all of these to try and produce a certain dynamic fluidity between the symptoms. They shift the polarities that are blocking the symptoms and are actually capable of helping somebody move the symptoms or change them from a vibrational level in such a way as to make them look like they don't exist. But in reality, it actually restarted the clock of the pain and accumulated more pain because it was another more sophisticated system of denial. So like teaching people to meditate to avoid the pain by feeling better, allopaths and naturopaths do the same thing. And then the final result is that when they're older, they just suffer and die anyway. But the problem is that stored pain at the bottom of the spine is actually waiting for them in sequence in the spirit world. So they can't get away from the thing they've been denying. And what's been shocking to me is to get glimpses of how powerful the soul is in a small act or a greater act. For example, when you think of somebody who has the, the immune compassion of love for all of the animal kingdom and they see somebody abusing an animal and they have this reactive rage to the Japanese and the whaling industry or something, but they don't realize that their act of rage is probably equal to 3,000 nuclear bombs being projected at the Japanese but the damage to the person and the whale is significantly less because the whale doesn't have a soul. I'm not saying it's right, but the greater damage of the rage, reaction, judgment from one soul to the other, far more damaging. Now we do that all, all the time. I mean, I'm doing it right now in my own cynicism of the U.S. political race going, who are these idiots? 
And right there, you know, in my judgment and my reaction, I'm sending out, you know, nuclear tipped torpedoes. So this is kind of where I am. I'm looking at this interior mechanism and it's all inspiring in its complexity. That's what's happening. And I would like to be able to have a greater opportunity to report on exactly how to use this. And the interesting thing that I'm, I, I'm looking at is, wow, the facade is probably, well, several hundred times at least, smarter than I am. And it has been there for a very long time. It's very sophisticated about knowing how to avoid things. It feeds me forms of addiction in order for me to avoid the level of the fear and the pain by producing all kinds of mannerisms of urges, impulses, and activities, many of them I like. And the reality is it's damaging. Now, the other part of it that I, I'm really uh, just enthralled with, that it may actually be possible to begin the process of dismantling this facade simply by the process of being willing to admit it's possible. Like building an acceptance. It is actually being willing to accept the likelihood, probability, that the facade of this nature is not in the shadows, it's actually who I am is the facade. And the engagement of the willing just to stop and go, I get it, it's bigger than me, I might actually need some help to grasp it, to feel it, to respect it, and where I first got to was being kind of angry at its existence. Wrong thing to do, that's called self-punishment. Then I had to get into learning how to have compassion for my own soul, infant soul, embryo soul, who at the moment of incarnation and early childhood had to engage this mechanism in order for me to survive incarnation. So I'm saying that the facade had a functional purpose in the beginning. But now the task is, as an adult, to dismantle it for the specific purpose of learning how to receive and feel love. Well, um, some, that's some of the things you taught about the light were learning to, you know, feel and receive divine love and have compassion for others and yourself and forgiveness. Sure. I think all of those terms, all those experiences are there, but the mere desire to receive divine love is not enough without the inherent response responsibility to remove the blockages that prevent the divine love from entering. So nobody else can remove the terror that covers my pain. I have to accept the responsibility to feel it, discover it, and find it myself because nobody else is going to remove it. And you can't simply put more light or love on top of it. It's like a, like a jar filled with marbles or rocks, and you're trying to pour more water into it. It's more the removal of the rocks and then the receiving of more love. Yeah. And so, so yeah, down at the bottom of the spine, again, we've got 
responsibility and humility. Yes, Rishi, is the inherent desire within myself to accept the responsibility that there were two choices at the very bottom of the spine. The first choice was made for me. That is, my instinct to survive, the will to survive, came first. And eventually, recognizing and appreciating how and why it got initiated gives me gradually, so far I haven't been able to do it, the opportunity to replace the will to survive instinct with a desire to progress. That desire to progress is a form of accepting the opportunity or responsibility to use my will in harmony with love. I'm the only one who can use my will at that level. I can later use my will to affect somebody else to some degree or another, loving or not, but I have to learn to build the occupying of my own will. Then to recognize that that will was greatly disturbed in the process of conception because of the environment my will came into, including my will being pounded by my mother and my father, who had passive aggressive forms of manipulation and their own terror, and I was infused with theirs. So the opportunity for me to gradually feel and remove what my parents put into me versus what's actually me. So at the very bottom of the spine, it does start out with the humility to feel everything that's there and begin to remove those things that may be there because they're instinctual, like the will to survive, but no longer serve my greatest good. Okay. And then there are other ones that are there. Shift that to a, a will to thrive and access what you desire to put into the world that's loving and truthful. Yes, so that gradually that process then has its own sequence to it. And I won't go into the sequence for the moment because I, I'm engaged in examining and feeling that innermost mechanism. And so far, the way for me to get there is having a, an element of faith that I'm engaged in a process I don't comprehend. I mean, the faith is, it's a miracle that we even exist. And the faith is, in that miracle, maybe this process also has an element of the miraculous. So I'm going to have faith in the process, and if you will, the goodness and the design of the universe. So I need some element of faith and trust. And then the willingness to go, okay, I'm going to examine any sacred cow or belief system inside myself. I need to feed and examine, even if it's a secret one, and gradually learn how to remove every one of them. So the most important part, what this discussion has been about, is the mechanics about how pain works. So the pain inside my soul from incarnation and early childhood has set in motion this pain-causing mechanism called my facade that now leads to all my conditions, all my relationship disruptions, and so on and so on. That's where I am today. 
maybe we'll report in another time and see what comes next. Thanks, Jason. Okay.